Welcome to ANA Investigates, a podcast featuring the latest in neurology and neuroscience brought to you by the American Neurological Association. I'm your host, Adeline Goss. This is a special episode of ANA Investigates on how neurology departments can recover from COVID-19. The scope and speed of the coronavirus pandemic are unprecedented in modern times. Our healthcare systems and society as a whole were unprepared for such a rapid and complete shutdown, and all areas of healthcare have been affected, including clinical practice, research, and education, with serious fiscal consequences. Many institutions have developed record deficits in record time. So the question now becomes, where do we go from here? What is our near-term strategy, and how might this change the future of academic medicine? Our interview today was conducted by Dr. Clifton Gooch, professor and chair of neurology at the University of South Florida Morsani College of Medicine and president of the Association of University Professors of Neurology, or AUPN. He spoke to Dr. Justin MacArthur, professor and chair of neurology at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. MacArthur specializes in neuroinfectious disease and neuroimmunology, and he is the president of the American Neurological Association. This episode is brought to you by ANA Investigates in partnership with the AUPN. Here's Dr. Gooch. Welcome, everyone, to this special edition of ANA Investigates in partnership with the Association of University Professors of Neurology. And welcome to you, Dr. MacArthur. Thank you, Cliff. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. So first, I would like to ask about the area of perhaps the greatest immediate impact, and that is on our clinical mission in academic medical centers. And I'll just comment a little bit on what we're doing, and then, uh, Justin, if you could talk a bit about perhaps what is going on at, at Hopkins. Uh, We did resume clinical activity, but our clinical activity has been restricted to 30% of maximum capacity. Um, And then the plan is ultimately to begin to gradually uh, increase uh, in-person patient visits um, as time goes on, though we are still uh, making maximal use of telehealth uh, everywhere we can. Um, What's going on at Hopkins? Uh, We have had a a very interesting, from an epidemiological point of view, a very interesting uh, shape to the curve in the sense that hospitalized patients uh, in our health system, and we have uh, five hospitals in the Baltimore, Washington area, uh, has basically been flat for the last two and a half weeks. We've had anywhere between 260 and 300 patients um, hospitalized with COVID-19 across our health system. Second is that we're, we're beginning to see some very important clusters of infection uh, in the Latino population here in Baltimore, and also in uh, several large uh, skilled nursing facilities. And um, modeling, which has been done through our School of Public Health here and the Center for Disaster Preparedness, really paints um, uh, a very unnerving picture for the next few months here in Maryland, because uh, we're uh, anticipating as social distancing becomes relaxed, uh, that there will be a secondary surge in July, August, and September with an even um, greater surge uh, if the schools were to open as we expect them to in September. So we, we are a long way from really seeing a substantial um, decline in hospitalizations here. And that means that our institutional leadership and our governor, in fact, have been um, uh, really quite conservative at allowing resumption of clinical activities. So we're allowed to have urgent ambulatory visits for patients who need um, neurological assessments or urgent lumbar punctures, urgent EMGs or EEGs. Uh, But essentially, we're really very limited in the uh, amount of um, uh, work that we can do uh, in person. I work with a lot of people who have MS, obviously, and, you know, it was, we were uncertain initially whether we should continue um, infusions for disease modifying therapy for MS. Um, and as a, as a center, we've really taken the stance that uh, for drugs that can be deferred, uh, like ocrelizumab, uh, we have deferred them for a few weeks until things stabilized. For drugs that really cannot be um, deferred, like Tysabri, because of the potential for rebound, we've uh, continued to, to use them. And the, our ability to see patients is contingent upon the changing landscape uh, of how we're tracking infection, how we're able to screen for it. So in terms of your screening procedures, um, here we are uh, questioning every patient, every person uh, who comes in at the door. We're trying to have patients themselves only come in and not family members. 
Um, and of course, everybody's using personal protective equipment. Um, are you also doing similar things along those lines? Oh, absolutely. We're doing the same uh, for for procedures uh, where there's high, you know, high contact, and that would include things like lumbar punctures, uh, muscle and nerve biopsies, uh, cutaneous nerve biopsies. Not EMG and EEG. We we are actually doing uh, pre-procedure COVID testing, you know, with the molecular tests. Um, we are anticipating with the recent approval of the FDA antigen test that that will probably be um, included perhaps on a point of care basis, but um, there's still some concerns about the sensitivity of that test. It's only rated at somewhere between 85 and 90% uh, sensitive. And so that could potentially miss uh, true infections. And we're just looking into that in terms of a validation basis. Now, the landscape seems to change every week in terms of our, the testing options we have available. And I think it's gonna continue to get better and better, but it will take time. Uh, I want to turn to research now and, and talk a little bit first about basic research. Obviously, there at Hopkins, you have a huge uh, basic research enterprise in the neurosciences. Uh, and could you comment a little bit about what's uh, what the effects of the, the pandemic have been on on the work itself, as well as on uh, funds flow from grants and other sources of support in the basic science laboratory? Well, pretty much within the first few weeks, all wet bench labs and clinical research that was non-COVID related uh, was closed down. Uh, individual researchers were told not to come to work in their labs. Their technicians were not allowed to come in unless they were uh, given specific approval to, you know, for example, keep a cell line going or a critically important animal experiment going. We've seen a, a, a plethora of COVID related research programs, including treatment uh, trials, including biomarker studies. One of the concerns, obviously, is how do we restart the non-COVID research? And there is a plan now over the next few weeks to um, allow labs to open up uh, with great attention to social distancing. Uh, we will probably have shift work for um, lab workers and for the postdocs and graduate students in the labs. Obviously, they'll be wearing protective equipment. We haven't dealt with this yet, but uh, we think if there is antigen testing, we may fall into a pattern of testing everyone once a week or that kind of periodicity. And tell us a little bit about what's been happening with clinical research at Hopkins. Certainly in clinical research, you know, wherever possible, we've tried to you know, pivot the research to do it uh, remotely, either via telemedicine or, or telephone. Um, our IRB allows for e-consenting, which is, is helpful. Um, but obviously for neurologic diseases, especially chronic neurologic diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases, a lot of the research involves you know, biomarkers, specimen collection, CSF, blood, uh, or, image, or imaging. And uh, obviously that's not something that can be easily converted to a telemedicine visit. And so we have basically uh, kept those uh, cohort type studies, those longitudinal studies uh, on hold um, in, in part because they, they can't be done and in part because of the safety of the research subjects. I'm really pleased at how the NIH has responded to this. And we had a, a wonderful discussion with Walter Karschitz from uh, NINDS who, who is very reassuring um, about the NIH's commitment to uh, continuing to fund research um, and support uh, existing, uh, existing grants, um, both for you know, established investigators as well as early stage investigators. So I'm really, um, I feel very positive about the response and support that, that we in the academic neurological community have had from our NIH institutions. Well, I would say that this whole experience for the United States has perhaps increased um, awareness uh, in the general public and respect for uh, the importance of medicine uh, and the entire healthcare team in a way that I've never seen before in my lifetime. So we can only hope that that will translate into um, uh, continuing funding of these uh, important missions of clinical care research and education. Well, I want to turn our attention now to something that uh, certainly as, as chairs we've been dealing with and our faculty too, uh, and that has to do with, uh, with fiscal austerity measures that are being implemented 
I think across the board in talking to different chairs in different states, we're hearing the same kinds of things being employed. We're being asked to increase our efficiencies, of course, to increase our clinical effort, to look for ways to cut expenses. But a lot of our expenses in medicine, of course, are in salary. So many places have undertaken salary cuts that are mandatory across the board, uh, mandatory furloughs for uh, staff and sometimes faculty, uh, depending upon their duties, uh, layoffs in some more extreme cases. Here at USF, uh, we're just now implementing an austerity pa package, which may include salary cuts for uh, faculty and staff. Uh, we've avoided furloughs and layoffs to the present time. We're certainly uh, you know, going gangbusters on telemedicine to try and keep revenues going there. Our surgeons are beginning to return to the OR with the easing of restrictions in Florida. What's going on at Hopkins in this regard? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's um, any different than what you've um, begun to experience there. And we're still, I have to say, at a real, relatively early stage of implementing um, our own austerity policy. Um, you know, one of the features of, uh, for our faculty who are School of Medicine employees is um, they, they're not going to have a direct reduction in their salary, but we are going to hold their 403B, their retirement uh, contributions uh, that are matched by the uh, School of Medicine and the university for one year. So there'll be effectively a, a salary reduction, but it won't be, it won't be seen in their take-home pay. We're also uh, cutting pay for um, uh, institutional leaders by somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. There'll be no merit increases uh, this year and possibly next. Some of our faculty, uh, particularly our, our, our surgeons, uh, receive uh, supplemental pay or incentive pay. That's going to be paid out this year, but we don't know what will happen next year. Next year, meaning uh, July 1st onwards. Um, and we've all, we also have a hiring freeze, both for staff and faculty, unless they're working in uh, COVID critical areas. So we, we, we're just a, at the point of implementing these and I have to say that the real pain has not yet begun. Yes, I, I would agree, especially with uh, some of the dramatic deficits that we're seeing in different uh, places around the country. I think that we've all been racking our brains about additional sources of grants and income at this time, but I'm not sure there are other sources that are substantial other than those that we have discussed. Are, are you aware of any other pots that we should be looking in right about now? Well, we've, we've taken a fairly aggressive approach um, at uh, I'll, I'll use the word marketing, but it's not really marketing so much as reassuring our existing and potential new patients that we're open for business. Um, I've done pretty regular um, video clips that I've sent out and, and other department directors or chairs have done this as well here at Hopkins uh, to um, our, pa our patient base and our referring physician base, basically reassuring them that the hospital's safe that we're open for business and that we can continue to provide neurological care for people who need it. We have taken, um, for neurologists, a surprisingly aggressive approach to just saying yes. You know, if somebody needs neurological care, we will provide it. We have also reached out to our donor base and done specific messaging to our donors. And just as one example, we raised money through our donor base to purchase uh, 20 uh, Mind Motion Go machines. These are uh, kinetic tele rehab machines that can be used both on the inpatient setting and at home. So we've actually delivered these to patients' homes um, as they've gone home from a stroke unit to allow them to continue their rehab uh, uh, remotely using tele rehab. And I think this is just another example of kind of the creative approach that um, some of our faculty have taken. Well, that's, uh, I think that's definitely the future. And I do believe that, uh, that this whole um, pandemic has accelerated many things many years ahead of where they otherwise would be. And, and now I, I would like to turn to some of our longer term future projections about what may be happening. Uh, and, and first, I want to come back to telehealth. You, you just mentioned uh, this uh, robotic telehealth solution for stroke patients uh, going home, needing rehabilitation and assessment. And there are a lot of things that affect this, of course, uh, continuing reimbursement, et cetera. So could you comment a little bit about your view of telehealth once the, the tidal wave of the pandemic has settled and, and perhaps we have a vaccine or some other treatments? 
what would you say telehealth will look like in two or three years? Well, we're, we're anticipating um, that telehealth and teleneurology for us, at least here at Hopkins, will, you know, to con will continue to be a major a component of how we deliver care. Um, and uh, we've discovered pretty rapidly, not only do the patients love it, their families love it because they don't have to take time off work or travel to our, our uh, hospital campus, uh, but our providers love it as well. It can, it's much more flexible. People do it in the evenings or at weekends when they, when they can, depending on childcare or their personal situations. So number one, it, it's, it's convenient both for patients and providers. Second, I think as we get better at doing telemedicine, we can actually get much more out of these visits for you know, neuromuscular assessment, et cetera. It's really imperative that we find a way to convince CMS and uh, the decision makers uh, around reimbursement for telemedicine that this is here to stay and uh, it needs to be part of uh, our uh, health toolkit for getting the US back working uh, again. So I'm personally, and the American Neurological Association is, and the AAN are pushing hard to maintain uh, that telemedicine continue to be reimbursed. And I know your organization, the AUPN, is doing the same. Yes, absolutely. No, I, I believe uh, for all the reasons you just, you just detailed, it's really essential that this move forward, but uh, appropriate reimbursement uh, and a uh, lack of uh, excessive regulatory burden are absolutely essential for us to be able to continue to do this. I'd like to uh, touch also on long-term impacts on, uh, on first on, on clinical care. Uh, obviously, a lot of care is being delayed. Um, many patients are still afraid to even go to the emergency room for things like stroke, uh, which we've certainly seen here and, and many other places have seen. Um, and that's going to have uh, echo uh, effects going uh, into the future for quite some time. So could you comment a little bit about your uh, estimate of what the impact on uh, clinical care will be and on our patients' health uh, going forward two or three years? Yeah, we thought about this a lot and have modeled it um, in a number of different ways. The demand or this pent up demand, so to speak, I think um, is going to be more dependent on uh, how individuals feel about coming to uh, uh, hospital settings where there are a large number of, of patients with COVID, such as ours, um, where whether or not they, ha they still have uh, health insurance through their employer, if they're still employed. And so, and so there are a number of other, if you will, secondary issues that I think are going to impact uh, care demand. I, I would also agree totally with that. And, and I think the, the big question mark here is, is how, how much will unemployment linger? Uh, we have these uh, un unbelievable unemployment rate currently. How long is that going to go on and have, how bad will it be in the long term? And that obviously is going to affect coverage. Uh, um, so one final question before we go, this one uh, perhaps even uh, deeper gaze into the crystal ball. <laughs> And that is, how long do you think it will be until uh, academic life as we know it uh, returns to some semblance of normal? Or are we entering an entirely new era and things are never going to look the same uh, and some things will be better, some things may not be so uh, good? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Great question. And I, I, um, I think that we, we are entering a very different era and um, we've been obviously been forced to do it quickly. But um, whether it's telemedicine or the um, adaptation to Zoom meetings, or uh, as we're going to do for the American Neurological Association this year, we've had to pivot to uh, hosting our annual meeting in October uh, virtually this year. This will be the first year since 1945 that we haven't had an in-person uh, American Neurological Association meeting. And I don't think this, this means that we're going to replace in-person or physical meetings uh, forever. But I do think that uh, especially our, our younger faculty are more used to interacting in a digital space or a digital environment. And um, we will probably see a lot more uh, virtual meetings um, or perhaps hybrid meetings where part of the meeting is done in person and part is done virtually. So I think that is gonna change um, life, academic life, very substantially. Well, this has been an outstanding discussion, and we've covered, I think, a lot of uh, topics that are uh, very much at the forefront of people's minds as they're dealing uh, with all the changes that they're facing every day among our listening audience. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here for this, uh, this great conversation.
Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here and stay safe. You as well. That was Dr. Clifton Gooch, professor and chair of neurology at the University of South Florida Morsani College of Medicine and president of the AUPN, speaking to Dr. Justin MacArthur, professor and chair of neurology at Johns Hopkins University and president of the ANA. That's it for today's show. You can submit your ideas for future episodes of ANA Investigates by visiting myana.org and clicking on the Education tab. For ANA Investigates, I'm Adeline Goss. This has been an episode of ANA Investigates, the official podcast of the American Neurological Association. Thanks for joining us for this episode. If you're not already a member of the ANA, please visit myana.org to learn more about the benefits available to ANA members, including access to an array of educational programs and resources, like online CME courses, webinars, the ANA's journals, the Annals of Neurology, and the Annals of Clinical and Translational Neurology, and more. Dr. Adeline Goss is our host. Our producers are Drs. Romer Giocaden, Adeline Goss, Michelle Johansson, Clifton Gooch, Danny Bega, Megan Ritchie, and Jim Sigler. This is your editor, Jen Hurley. Copyright, the American Neurological Association.